Welcome to IFPA's 2020 Industry Insights, another adventure in webcasting. My name's Bob Munn, and I have been looking forward to today's session since Tim Brennan and I began talking about it last fall in New Orleans at the IFPA conference. This whole thing started on Bourbon Street outside the famous Door Bar, which may have something to do with why it took so long to actually make it happen. We're going to get to Tim in a quick minute, but first, I'd like to make you aware of IFPA's latest innovation. Last month, we announced the new IFPA app, available through the Apple App Store. This makes your iPhone and iPad ground zero for all of your IFPA resources. Not only can you have all the conference details and IFPA breaking news right there on your, I, on your Apple mobile device, but one of those little buttons on that screen will take you to the YouTube recordings of our past 2020 sessions. Yeah, you can access all of 2020's archived content, which is, subtle, which is a subtle way of saying all of the episodes for which I didn't screw up the recording. But over the past three years, we really have come a long way. Now, the first year of this was titled Coffee Breaks and primarily consisted of sales training three times per month. And that, those took place before we really figured out how to record these things. But the first 2020 session back in January 2011 really set the tone. Now today, you can't go to a publishing conference anywhere anymore and not hear about publishers taking on the role of digital agency. Dan Buendo and Mark Helmer, the fathers of 2020 by the way, were talking about this two and a half years ago and they had been in it for years before that. Now this is the first recording we did. We had to break it down into three sections because of YouTube's limitations back then. It's kind of primitive. In fact, it probably deserves to be done over, Dan, Mark, but the, the material is still more relevant than ever before. It's vital. Now, Lou Ann Sorensen and Tina Dentner from Metro Creative Graphics followed that up with a look at the way their service helps blend print and online campaigns for your customers. Now, down in Houma, Louisiana, Brian Rushing supplements his free publication with a spectacular community magazine point of view. And he and his editor, Terry Trahune, sat down to outline some of, some of the ideas that they've had on starting similar publications in your markets. Barb Perry and Doug Fabian were in here to discuss promotions and programs that they use internally to keep their sales teams fresh and on point. Now this one, if you remember, was produced from a hotel room in Atlanta, which taught us that we don't want to do that anymore. The highlight for me was when the maid came into the room in the middle of it to change the room. Good stuff. Good stuff. Now, this is the topic that really blew up huge interest in using the iPad as a sales team tool and it happened like so many things do because of a conversation in a conference. A bunch of us were sitting sitting around a table and JW kept saying yeah we do that and yeah we do that too and one of our most popular 2020 topics was born. If any of you haven't seen this one there's stuff in there that I'm still using in my training today. Now Tim Bingaman would be embarrassed to hear me say this, but anyone who's paying attention knows that he and his people at CVC are one of the community publishing industry's secret weapons. Now here, he talked about publishers who made distribution conversions from mail or carrier to demand distribution. In some ways, it's a cautionary tale and something, something everyone should look at before, before they consider a transition like that. Now with this one, 2020 went back to its sales training roots. This guy came in and he talked about the way that salespeople talk about money. I don't remember a whole lot about that session, but as I recall, that guy was really, really good. Justin Jarena came in to show us how SitesOne empowered traditional publishers to build websites for their customers. And a number of publishers who adopted this have, have great success stories, and it's, it's one of many examples of the way IFPA's industry vendors are really the research and development arm for our industry. There's so much that we can learn from them. 
Now, website development is a key element of the digital agency, and that brought Dan Buendo back to us again to show us how their agency, Envision Marketing, manages client Facebook presences and gets paid for it. Our good friend Joe Nicastro came in to show us how he uses technology to do the job of a half dozen salespeople on his seven monthly publications. Joe continues to be one of our industry's most prolific innovators. Barb Perry came back in to talk about the opportunities in selling CadNet ads. There are people, and I'm not going to name names, who have built seven-figure businesses based on hooking publishing association programs up with the right advertisers. I know it drives Barb crazy to think of all the money that we're leaving on the table out there. Our buddy J.W. Owens was back for a triumphant return after his gangbusters presentation on the iPad. This one focused on apps that salespeople use on all their mobile devices to enhance productivity. Again, well worth the time you'd invest to watch it. And speaking of vendors performing the research and development function for our industry, Ken Hubert is a, is a publisher in suburban Milwaukee who's on the leading edge of mobile advertising solutions. Ken's approach to, to publishing is truly innovative, one you should learn more about, and you can, you can pick that up on your, uh, on your uh, IFPA app, which Ken was instrumental, I might add, in helping to develop for the association, and we thank him for that. Lee Little from Bar Z Adventures was in here a couple of months ago to explain his approach to building custom apps. Now, I just saw one that he did for, for JW and Glenn Fetzner down in Florida, and you take a look yourself. Use your own judgment, but I really think they've taken this to another level. Well worth watching. And finally, I saved this one for last because it has by far been our most popular session. Joe Mathis's, Joe Mathis's innovative approach to auto dealer advertising really has to be seen. And from the, the viewing numbers, you probably have. But Joe's approach is a textbook example of what an innovative publisher can do for his customers when, when, he's, when he's pushed to do it. And, and Joe's just done some great work for, for his folks. Now, as I said before, most of these sessions are available through our YouTube channel or links from the IFPA.com website or directly through the, the new IFPA app. Just go to the Apple App Store, search on IFPA, take your free download. Now, instead of talking about past sessions, we have a live one with us right now. Tim Brennan from MultiAd is no stranger to any of us who attend community publishing conferences. For years, he's been the guy focused on making your customers the local champions for national brands in your markets. And as I said before, this ses session has been a long time coming. I'm happy to have him join our group this morning. Tim, welcome. Thanks, Bob. Good to be here. Great. Yeah, vo volume's a little low there, buddy. Okay. Okay, we'll work on that. Oh, oh there you go. Okay. Now we're talking. Now we're talking. Okay, uh before I turn the the controls over to Tim, everybody knows this is always one of the one of the dicier aspects of the uh of the operation. But I I want to remind you, the 2020 is an is an interactive program. You drive the content with your questions. Use that dashboard on your screen to type in your questions and comments, and we'll address as many as we can within our time constraints. You're going to have questions, and Tim is here to answer them. If you don't get your question addressed, it's going to be because you were, it's going to be because you were too shy to ask it. So, so get me your questions. We'll do everything we can to get them answered. You're looking pretty good over there, Tim. Excellent. Good. Glad to uh, see just that the technology works. That just this is this is the smoothest transition we've ever we've ever had. Now we've we've determined earlier today that Tim's actually done more of these than I have. So with the seniority, if anything goes wrong today, I think we're just going to blame it on him. Uh, yes, yesterday I was exchanging emails with a friend of mine, and, and her question was whether today's content was better suited for managers or salespeople. And my answer to that was that the most vital key to a successful co-op advertising initiative is an energized sales force. If the sales team isn't into it, all these opportunities, 
all these free ad dollars that Tim and his people put out there for us go by the boards. It's the, the, uh, the involvement of the sales team is absolutely vital. Now, Tim, when you get right down to it, the essence of successful co-op advertising is really a partnership, isn't it? That's right, Bob. It's a partnership between the manufacturer and the local dealers in the market. And how media can best play off of that is to provide a partnership to the local dealer to show them how these co-op programs can work within their media offerings. It's really not rocket science. This is advertising. But because the manufacturer has so many hoops to jump through as far as these programs go, it becomes a little daunting for not only the sales rep in the field, but also for the dealer who sells that stuff. They're as cut to the bone as we are, so the challenge is in trying to make this pretty much streamlined across the board, and that's where we come at it. I've been around in co-op advertising for a lot longer than I really want to admit. I've been with multi-ad since the turn of the century, which you can actually say these days. <laughs> uh, before that, I was a co-op manager at a couple of different uh, daily newspapers in the Northeast. Um, and prior to that, I was an ad director for a chain of discount department stores. Remember when we had those? Um, <laughs> so co-op was really integral in, in our retail operations. And I've used that experience from the whirling 80s <laughs> to really drive um, business right up till now with all of the media partners around the country. So, so we'll start at uh, kind of the brass tacks and explaining what this stuff is and kind of roll through how this can intersect with your day-to-day -day operations. Um, so first off, you know, like Bob said, co-op advertising is a partnership. It's, uh, it's an arrangement between the manufacturer and uh, the local retailer to reimburse that dealer for local placement of the manufacturer's brand advertising. More or less, this is not free money falling from the sky. This is built into the cost of the products that that dealer buys. It's all based on the volume they do. And that sets up a budget for the dealer to run advertising promotions saying, hey, that sexy product you want, I sell it right here. The whole impetus of this thing is to, A, highlight the brand in the local market and this dealer as a place to buy it, and B, sell more stuff. The bottom line with all of these programs is to move more inventory through that local dealer. And, you know, the key to all of this stuff is that there are brands that have these base programs for dealer marketing. There's lots of options within those. One of those is local media placement. Every one of these brands you see here has a co-op program or a co-op offering to its local dealer base to help that dealer promote, hey, I am the place to get Maytag appliances, Allstate Insurance, Snapper Lawnmowers, Armstrong Flooring, Yamaha ATVs, motorcycles. All of those brands have specific strategies on how to assist those dealers in placing local advertising. So the key for you guys is to try to assimilate some of what the brands want their dealers to do into the media options that you provide. And there are some pretty basic steps we can go through to help integrate this stuff with your day-to-day -day life. First off, provide co-op research to dealers. What I mean by that is anytime you see a local dealer with a brand name product, you see a sign on the door, a banner in the window, a display on the floor, find the brand name co-op program. You can Google it um, or you can come to a database like ours to get the full schematic of what that co-op program is. Never assume that the dealer is completely boned up on this. 
as a informed sales rep, bring them a copy of the co-op program just in a, hey, just so you know that we know that you know there's a co-op program for the stuff you sell, and hey, I think I can help you with it. And that type of approach can go a long way. The second is every brand has specific advertising requirements. You'll see some of these ads in competing media. You'll, you can search for them on YouTube if you're selling video. You can search for them on Google Images if you just type in the brand name. With our database, we collect those from manufacturers. We get their up-to-date sales promotions. We get ongoing newspaper and print promotions from these, from these manufacturers as a impetus to help our clients, the media, help their clients, the dealers, do this stuff right. So, you know, kind of in the approach to the dealer, hey, here's a co-op program for the stuff you sell. Hey, here's an ad for the stuff you sell. How do we do this? Hey, there's a contact on this co-op program. Have you ever used it? Should we call them and find out what you're eligible for and how to do it? More or less, the more you can break down for the dealer in what to do, what this means, how it works, is really going to kind of help your sales process and help the dealer absorb that information and, and, and potentially run that with you. So break down the ad, maybe customize it with their information on it so they can visualize that, visualize that ad running in your publication. Tailor a proposal. Hey, what would you do if you were king of that business? You know, what is the right advertising schedule to get the best bang for the buck with your readership? And then, you know, can we investigate any potential funding? You know, is there a contact on that co-op program that you and the dealer can reach out to to find out what kind of resources you might have available? Um, provide more or less tee up the opportunity for the dealer and present it that way. Third part would be providing an approval service for co-op. And what I mean by that is if the dealer is truly invested in doing this, hey, this is a great idea, I'd love to do this, if you can get the co-op for it, let's go ahead, more or less every manufacturer has a marketing department or co-op department that is the approval process for these programs. They want to make sure that the dealers who are trying to do the right thing with co-op advertising actually do the right thing with co-op advertising. So they want to review these ads before they're published. More or less make sure that the manufacturer logo is properly presented, that there is a product illustration or photo within the ad, the same romance copy that the manufacturer would use related to that product, that the pricing is correct and not below any minimum advertised pricing guidelines that the manufacturer has. There's a lot of specific um, aspects to the ad the manufacturer wants to have a look at before the dealer runs those. So if you can provide that over to the contact on the co-op program, they'll give it a quick review and send you back any changes that might be necessary for that particular ad or an, a base approval code to say, yes, this has been noted for this dealer, which will help the things move along. And the last part, which is often neglected by a lot of media companies, is providing the claim documentation that the dealer needs to get reimbursed. In all cases with co-op advertising, the dealer is paying you directly for the advertising. That process does not change. What does change is that the dealer has to take a copy of that invoice you provide, tear sheets, screenshots, insert pieces, direct mail pieces, whatever the case may be, proof of performance, proof that they actually ran that ad, applied to that particular listing on the invoice, submit that to the manufacturer, and they're reimbursed directly from the manufacturer for that spend. Usually it's in the form of a credit on their account. Sometimes it's a separate check. Sometimes it's free goods. On all of the OOP programs that we document, we'll tell you specifically how those, how those co-op monies are reimbursed to the dealers. And the turnaround these days is, is pretty quick. 
manufacturers recognize the cash flow issues involved in these programs with dealers. And you've gotten to a point now where the turnaround time on co-op reimbursement is in the two to three week time frame. So two to three weeks from when a manufacturer receives a claim for co-op, it's paid back to the dealer through whatever mechanism they have in place to more or less congratulate the dealer on doing that and try to emphasize that they should continue to do that and keep this thing going. So those are the four steps to really master the co-op process. Uh, Tim? The co-op? Yes. Thank you. I've, I've got a question here, and I thought I didn't mean to interrupt you there, but it just seemed like this would be a perfect place to, to get this, this question in for you because it deals with proof of performance. And this is obviously from someone who's who's been through the wars as, as long as you and I have. But and, and I, they, they say we realize that there's no hard and fast answer to this, but do you find that more of the plans are accepting uh, electronic tear sheets Rather than uh, ha having to go through all the pick and shovel work of the of the physical tear sheet, is that is that something that more of the plans are accepting now? Yes, yeah. On the back end, what happens is the manufacturer actually databases all of that activity and has to actually keep a record of it for a number of years to prove the uh, the reimbursement back to the dealer and the cash flow involved in these processes. Um, in some cases, the manufacturer will still require a print tear sheet or after you submit an e-tear sheet, they may come back to you for kind of a spot on it on, okay, I know the e you gave me the e-tear sheet, but give me a physical tear sheet so that I can prove what came off the press. What they recognize pretty succinctly is that any e-tear sheet is mm -hmm. a production file. That's not what came off the press. That's what went to press. In some of the cases where there are specific color charges or uh, programs like Verizon Wireless is very um, particular with this, they want to see specifically what came off the press, not all the time, but in a spot audit case, to prove yeah. that the media actually did fulfill this production file as a, a live tear sheet. So okay. kind of case okay. by case. In the, in, uh, I have another question coming in, and by the way, keep keep those questions coming. Uh, the uh, the question here is, and and I think you may answer this further down the line, but I, I wanted to to make sure this this question got addressed. If a dealer, you were talking before about taking the initiative to to introduce the the merchant to his own co-op programs in many cases, but if the dealer has no idea about co-op available. Where can we search to find details about their particular plans? Got any ideas on that? Um, yeah, any co-op program that we database is available to all dealers of the brand nationwide. There are caveats to that. If a dealer buys through a distributor and not directly from the manufacturer, the distributor controls the co-op monies and they have the option of passing them along to their dealer base. The best way for a dealer to find out specifically what's available to them is to reach out to the guy they buy the stuff from. Every manufacturer has a rep in the field. Um, if not, you know, the distributor has a rep in the field that will call on these dealers to, you know, buy the stuff. You know, they are the intersection for the product purchase, the, you know, the entire relationship with the manufacturer. You know, they're, you know, they're responsible for product shipment, for finance, for delivery, for, you know, any warranty claims along those lines. So these guys are busy on a lot of aspects of the manufacturer's relationship with the dealer. Co-op advertising is part of that. Why does co-op not often get communicated to the dealer? Because that rep has a territory that's likely two or three states with, you know, three to four hundred active accounts. When they finally get in front of the customer, they've got a lot of things to review. So co-op, if the dealer hasn't brought it up in the past, may not be high on the priority list of things we've got to review today. So always go to that guy. He'll know what's available, and if not, he'll know who the dealer has to go through to get that answer. 
Got it. Long answer to a short question. <laughs> um, so the four steps are really kind of key to the process. One, showing the dealer the co-op program and some sort of you know embedded knowledge that you know what you're doing with it. You know, you don't have to be you know totally boned up on the nuances between a fixed rate and an accrual-based co-op program. You should know that there is a marketing program, there are rules and requirements to it, and there's somebody you can talk to to describe what those are for you and for the dealer. Provide the ad materials. You know, all manufacturers, most manufacturers will have pre-made materials for you to work from for that dealer. Integrate those into the dealer's advertising program and show them how that can help expand their advertising based on the increased budget from co-op and in some cases clean up their advertising a little bit present a uh, prettier picture in their advertising to get people to focus on the stuff they sell approve that stuff through the manufacturer you know make that connection with the folks who run the plan and then follow that up with all of the documentation some of this stuff can be automated you know on the documentation side if you can flag co-op and order entry or something along those lines so that it spits out a separate invoice at the end of the schedule those things can be maximized um, but you know more or less looking at those four steps as a whole for any dealer that might have brand name products in your marketplace is a worthy exercise to go through so from there we kind of split off into you know what does this apply to you know obviously print you know Co-op for print and newspapers has been around literally since like 1903. First documented co-op program was, according to some sources, Warner Lingerie paying local department stores to promote its new line of corsets back in 1903. That supposedly is the first physical co-op program. And I remember has, that. Those ads were hot. <laughs> I knew you would say that. <laughs> and it, it's expanded from there. You know, Coke has a very lucrative program with dealers. Um, unless you're buying a million dollars from Coke, you know, it's a it's not a good one for us to go after. Um, but they have had a long-standing uh, program as far as trade promotion goes, which is pretty well documented. Um, all of these programs now, obviously, move into different areas. They pay for online now, they pay for mobile in some cases, they pay for mail and inserts. So there's lots of opportunities for broaching out different programs to your dealer base. Don't let them think that this is just a print thing they have to run with you because some dealers don't want to focus their entire budget there. There are lots of ways that you can expand this to other media to make this more fully fledged into all of the media options that you guys provide. So kind of playing this thing through, you know, what you have to recognize is that co-op is many things to many different people. These programs are complicated, but it's not because they don't want the dealers to use these co-op monies that it's complicated. It's complicated because there's lots of cooks in the soup. There's sales involved in this process because those guys intersect with all of the local dealers. There's marketing involved in the process because, hey, we created this brand, spent billions of dollars making it. We don't want local dealers to destroy it. We have um, you know, accounting involved in this. They have to pay back these dealers through a mechanism. So if somebody wants a good eyeball on that. You got legal involved in this because what if a dealer does this? What if a dealer does that? So all of these programs have a pretty tight scrutiny from the top level and how these work and the rules and regulations are always kind of revolving around that. These programs are also known by different terms. So you may call into a manufacturer and say, hey, I'm calling about the co-op program and they'll say, what? Yeah, it might be known as channel marketing, it might be known as sales promotion allocations, it might be known as advertising allowances or market development funding, a lot of different terminology rolls around in this thing. And it all falls under one group terminology called trade promotion, which involves a lot of different things. Co-op is just one aspect of trade promotion, which allocates for local advertising, but trade promotion also allows for 
markdown of existing products so that the sales rep can clear that inventory and get the dealer to buy the new stuff. You'll recognize that with, you know, Macy's running a 25% off Clinique sale. Macy's is not taking any less money for the product on the shelf. Clinique is actually paying the 25% difference in that sale item to Macy's in order to, in order to run that promotion and clear the inventory for the new stuff that's set to come down. So the overall process in this thing is this little recycling triangle here. More or less it's you know the manufacturer distributor providing an allowance down to the dealer to create advertising, to create demand for that product. You know, the dealer runs that ad um, saying, hey, come on down today and buy, you know, brand X widgets for 25% off, customer comes in the door with that ad, buys the brand widgets, which necessitates the dealer going back to the manufacturer, ordering more product, running another ad, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This is all about moving inventory and keeping that brand fresh within the local dealer. Um, hey, uh, Tim? Said, Yes. Tim, okay, I, I got a, got a note here. Uh, a couple of folks are noticing that your your voice is going higher and lower. I don't know if that has to do with distance from the mic, or or, or how you're doing it. You, I don't know if if you're if you're walking around or, or whatever. But it, if you if you get if your distance from the mic is varying, it's it's showing up on this on on this end. Okay. So just just a note there. I, I, it, it could, as you and I discussed earlier, the, the sound quality could vary with a with a lot of different technical shortcomings of of webinars. But if it's if it's the distance from the mic, I just wanted to make you aware of it that it's showing up here. Cool, got it. Yeah. I'll try okay, to thanks, buddy. More got it there. All right. So apologies for that, guys. But um, where we go to now is kind of the budgets established for co-op. Like I said earlier, this is not endless supplies of money dropping from the sky. This is what's known as an accrual. It's the base that the advertise, the manufacturer sets for local advertisers on how they establish a co-op budget. Usually it's a percentage of purchases that's applied to their total purchase volume that establishes a set bucket of money they work from. So as an example, say I'm working with Spacely Sprockets, and they have a 2% accrual, which is pretty average amongst manufacturers. If you buy $100,000 worth of Sprockets from Spacely, more or less that's applied to the manufacturer's co-op percentage so that you know, your accrual balance is $2,000 or 2% of your $100,000 purchase. What you should probably get pretty good at is basic math when it comes to these co-op programs. You know, one of the easiest ways I, I use to determine you know, broadly what my dealers had available when I was on the media side was to have them guesstimate how much business they've done with the brand over the time frame that the manufacturer said was their accrual period. You know, I said, okay, so about how much business did you do last year with Space Lease Rockets? Was it $10? Was it $10 million? About what is that number? Oh, it's $50,000? Well, 2% of $50,000 is $1,000. That should be about how much co-op money you've got. Hey, on the co-op program, here's somebody we can call and verify that. Or, you know, I can take it back to the office and run with it there. Make it simple and always make it sound like you know basically what you're doing. That's the key in some of these things. So an accrual is just a percentage of the dealer's business with the manufacturer to set that co-op budget. Manufacturer also has a participation rate, which is essentially how much of the ad cost is the manufacturer going to reimburse the dealer for up to whatever accrual budget they have. So what you find is the average manufacturer will have a 50% participation rate, which means of that $2,000 in Spacely Sprocket co-op money I've got, I need to run 
$4,000 in advertising to get that all back. $4,000 at 50% is $2,000, which is my accrual limit. I have to create a budget or an advertising platform equal to $4,000 in order to claim all of my co-op money back. Of course, you know, those ads have to meet the guidelines. They have to go through the, the process of being approved with the manufacturer and then claimed from the manufacturer, but that's the, the impetus for claiming my co-op money back. And there's timing around all of this stuff. It's not an endless loop on ordinarily with most manufacturers. They'll have an accrual period, hey, here's the time frame that we measure your purchases. So this could be any of a number of different things. One of the things that screws dealers and media up with co-op programs is that everyone is different. Benjamin Moore paints is much different than Pittsburgh paints. All state insurance is a lot different than state farm insurance. Each one has the different nuances that the manufacturer brand has put in place to try to stimulate these programs, and you've got to pay attention to them. Those are all stated clearly on our co-op programs, and I would assume pretty clearly on what the manufacturer gives the dealer as well. Manufacturer also has a performance period, which is the time frame that the co-op money must be spent. This could be different than the accrual period. Benjamin Moore has their co-op program based on last year's purchases, as does Ace Hardware, as does True Value Hardware. They tally up the entire calendar year purchase from that dealer in the beginning of the following year, multiply it by the co-op percentage, the accrual percentage, and then pass that information down to the dealer. The performance period is the calendar year current year. These dates are part of the challenge with local dealers, trying to keep track of what's available to them when and when they have to use it. Some programs expire mid-year. Not all co-op programs expire at the end of December, though many do. So it's something that has to be recognized and pretty much planned for in order to make this whole thing come together. So. What completely messes this thing up further is that there are different types of co-op programs. Not all co-op is created the same. You know, accruals may vary, percentage, participation percentages might vary, um, but there are completely different structures to co-op programs as well. You know, the ones we tend to focus on, the brands I showed you in the beginning, those all have formal co-op programs. Brands like these guys, like Auric Vacuums and Pandora and Subaru Parks and Service and even a company called Hanky Panky. They have set accrual balances. They have set reimbursement structures. They have specific creative media guidelines in order for the dealer to promote local brands. And speaking of formal, Jackie Freeman has a formal co-op program for their formal suits. It's 3% accrual and 50% reimbursement. Very standard stuff. But then you move on to what are known as specially arranged co-op programs. These are all based on essentially a manufacturer, sales rep, or distributor's discretionary budget where there is no preset accrual base for a dealer to work from. But what the manufacturer does is allow for the dealer to come to them with a specific advertising plan hey, here's my plan to sell X more, which is negotiated based on the strength of the, the proposal itself and the potential to sell more stuff. If you're a dealer that generally does $50,000 in business annually and you come to them with a co-op program, with a advertising program that says, hey, I'm going to do this during peak season, I'm going to run these ads, this this network by, et cetera, et cetera, it's going to cost me $2,000, but I think I can sell $10,000 more, the manufacturer will take it under advisement, and, and if it makes sense for that particular dealer and is the right time frame with a budget that has not already been allocated to other folks, they could potentially pay for it. So you see brands like this, like... Hill Science Diet Pet Foods, like AC Delco, 
um, auto accessories, Panasonic appliances, Goodman heating and heating back uh, ventilation, air conditioning stuff. These brands work based on their local manufacturer sales reps connecting with local dealers to try to generate new business based on exciting sales promotions, new media promotions with those dealers and different ways of promoting the brand in the local marketplace. Now, one thing that has to be noted is these manufacturer sales reps are commission-based salespeople just like you. They make more when they sell more, and they're going to sell more when their stores promote more. So those stores need to come to them with ideas. Hey, what if I do this? How could I do that? As long as it's backed up by having internal promotion as well, signage, guys wearing the T-shirt, talking up the product to consumers that come in the door, these all have a good chance of building new business through your media platforms. You just have to encourage your guys to do this and reach out to these manufacturer reps to get their assistance. And then there's brands that have no co-op program. We database those in, in our library as well. That just simply means the manufacturer has nothing formally established as far as paying back local dealers for advertising. But it simply means that it can be deal-based as well. Believe me, if you've got the largest dealer of space lease sprockets in the Northeast and they want to advertise that fact, the sales rep who sells them those sprockets would be an idiot if he didn't help them in some way, shape, or form. And it doesn't need to be cash money reimbursement for that dealer. The manufacturer has a lot of different ways that they can pay back local dealers for this promotion. It could be free goods. It could be you know, special dating on their invoicing. It might be free shipping or, you know, any of a number of different ways that the manufacturer could incentivize the dealer to do this stuff. And they've got promotional goods back at the office as well. How could they help this dealer or encourage this dealer to be more promotional and, you know, stay out there with, hey, I've got the biggest supply of space lease profits on the planet. You know, that's going to encourage people to come in and buy more which, you know, that sales rep for the manufacturer will earn more based on the increased volume. You know, think about the partnerships that businesses work with on a daily basis. You know, realtors and mortgage lenders is a good example. Two different businesses that play well together. Co-op, in essence, is just a co-funded advertising opportunity. So any two related businesses could potentially promote together and how can you encourage that? You know, think of paint stores with painting contractors. Think of building supply companies with you know, general contractors and specific contractors for home improvement goods. How can you tie those guys together around a brand to help both of those businesses succeed? You know, paint store sells Benjamin Moore paint painter uses only gray paint like Benjamin Moore to paint your house. Now, what kind of relationships can you create there where nothing really might be in existence right now to make it work? See, the problem with media getting into co-op is that there's a lot of hoops to jump through. And generally what we've found over the course of time is that when media gets into co-op, they focus exclusively on the money, which is not a terrible thing. And if you've got good relationships with your dealers, it can be a very, very lucrative type of effort. But, you know, there's a lot of steps involved. So you start out and you do an audit of the top brands of your local dealer. You sit down with the dealer and say, okay, about how much business would you do with those? Hey, who do you buy them from? What's your account number with that? And then take that back to the office to reach out to the sales reps and manufacturers on the list. If they say, you know, no, we don't have any co-op program, then with that brand you go into a standard advertising type of process. If the dealer wants to promote it, hey, it, you know, they're not going to pay you back, but here's what we can do. If it's yes, well, okay, you look at the specific co-op guidelines they send you. 
If it's a formal co-op program, you go in one direction. If it's no co-op or specially arranged, hey, you've got to go through that manufacturer sales rep. How much business do they do with that brand? Is it enough to warrant doing anything? There I would put a benchmark at about $20,000 a year. That's the minimum of something that I would work from because 2% of $20,000 is about $400. You could do something with that. Anything below that, yeah, not as much. So does that warrant any assistance? Okay, yes, well, okay, develop a brand proposal along the same lines of, A, if it's a formal co-op program, what's available to them, and kind of work out the math based on that. You work with the manufacturer or sales rep to get the appropriate materials, the appropriate dollar volume, go through, tally it all up for what kind of advertising budget you want to run, and then develop ads that meet guidelines, get approval for those, run the campaign, and then produce the documentation for it. A lot of different steps, and unless you have a really good relationship with the business you're working from, this could be a six to eight week process to get anything going. A lot of time frame for what may not be a lot of effort, and a lot of uh, return on that. That said, there's a ton of money out there. Co-op programs, it's estimated, tally about $100 billion in advertising potential every year. Now, just based on the wholesale volume of all of the products generated through the United States and the co-op allocations based on those, that's about $100 billion a year. And of that, it's estimated about $11 billion of that goes unused just because the programs are complicated, the dealers are cut back to the bare bone, they don't have time to look into all of the variations involved in the co-op program. $11 billion just kind of slips away every year. So how much does your market flush away with that? Think of the, the dealers of brand name stuff in your market your local State Farm Insurance guy, your local Ace Hardware store, your local Anderson Window contractor, how much of that goes away? And, you know, if plumbing is where you're going to go, B&K Mueller does offer 100% co-op reimbursement on their plumbing equipment ads, so you can at least fix your toilet. Um, there are, you know, a lot of different variations on co-op to work from. But the bottom line is most brands do business with local dealers, and those dealers need to understand that those brands have programs there to help them. So what brands do your stores do business with? Where do they buy those products? Is it a local sales rep who shows up every month or so? Is it a distributor that they call into? Is it a telemarketer they work with with the manufacturer in order to get their order across? How does that process work? And with that store, which manufacturer reps do you have a good relationship with? Who do you go out to lunch with or invite over to your barbecue and stuff? You know, who do you really enjoy doing business with? Because those reps will always lean towards the folks that they like. And they'll get the best opportunities with stuff. So even if you're working from a formal co-op program and, you know, and you've got everything buttoned down as far as how the co-op works, it's always a good idea to keep those reps looped into the process so that they know that the advertising is going to happen and can provide the dealer with any additional inventory they might need, sell more stuff in order to cover the ad. Um, but if if it's a good ad program and it's created some business, they might find additional marketing funding and resources to help that dealer do it more. Uh, and, and if you're working with a vitamin store, Nature's Bounty Vitamins does offer a specially arranged co-op program that those stores can work through their sales rep to get funding for. Finding co-op is not a problem. You, dealer locators for store, uh, for manufacturer brands can show you where to get that particular product in the marketplace. That's what we focus on from our co-op database. But just walking into stores and looking at signage and displays, you know, that's going to tell you right off the bat who they should have co-op money with. You look at these displays, write them down, go back to a database or Google the brand, and you may find the co-op program related to those. All of these guys have 
specific advertising programs related to local brand promotion. In some of those, like in the flooring category, the dealer actually has to buy these displays, and that's what counts as some of their co-op allocation, but there's generally more than just that display money to keep them going. You know, where this thing needs to be is to focus specifically on advertising. Don't focus so much on the money. And before I go any further, don't sell co-op. Sell your readership, your viewership, your audience. That's what you're selling. Co-op is merely a means of presenting the brand stuff and the potential co-op money to help those guys do what you're recommending. You know, start the same way. Look at the brands that folks have and guess at how much business they do with those. You can generally tell by looking at the display on the floor. Is it dusty and doesn't look like it's been touched in over a year? Or is it pretty fresh and it's well stocked? You know, is that dealer open to a brand advertising campaign or do they always run, hey, 25% off my store this weekend? You know, if they're not interested in that stuff, you know, stick with what you got. If they are, then go look up the co-op to help support them. You know, build different ad options. Show them how these programs can run if you have access to the ad materials from the brand. Build up, build up specific proposals. You know, hey, manufacturer has this promotion going on during this time frame. If I were you, I would run ads here, here, and here. Total schedule is six ads, going to cost $6,000. We'll collect this program, pays 50%. That means your out-of-pocket is really just three grand for this promotion. That's pretty huge. And if the dealer says, hey, that's a pretty cool idea, well, who's your sales rep for those? Let's get in touch with them and see if you do have the $3,000 to do those. So the dealer makes the connection with the sales reps instead of you. The dealer makes the connection with the manufacturer and has already shown interest in advertising. Together, you contact the manufacturer, confirm what co-op money it is. You know, you work up your ad campaign from that, and any ads that you make up, you make sure that you show them to the contact with the manufacturer to make sure that they're going to get reimbursed. When it's all said and done, hey, we've got it all buttoned together, confirm that with the dealer, and run with it. Focus on advertising itself. That's you know, Tim, sense. that's a that's a really good point, and a lot of a lot of people miss that. The, the the selling we tend to think of the selling point as being the fact that the, that our merchant is leaving all this money laying on the table, but he really doesn't see the value of it unless unless we address the original hot buttons of the sale, something that he has to gain from it. What's in it for him? What he what he can actually advertise and generate new revenue from? That's a that's a great that's a great point about fo focusing on the advertising rather than the money. Precisely. One of my one of my most successful clients was actually up here in New Hampshire, and she just focused on selling the ads themselves, just because they were great content, and that you know the dealer needed to promote those brands through her media, because none of her readership was going to know they had the best prices on Sealy mattresses on the planet unless they promoted the fact. So she sold the ads regardless of whether the dealer had co-op. The co-op was just a potential benefit byproduct of the advertising itself, which she made key. Every ad that hit our database from manufacturers was put in front of local clients, and they were given a specific schedule that they should run with it. Some did not you know, buy into it, but a lot did, just based on the value of her audience and her ability to, you know, make this whole thing come together. The focus there was on advertising, and that's where it should be. You know, you, know, you look through all of these co-op programs, and, you know, there's a lot of fine print. And the dealer is very confused about it. If they've never used it in the past or talked with their sales rep about it before, this is mind-boggling stuff. You've got to make this simple. So in our database, we cut all through all that clutter so you don't have to. You know, we kind of boil all this down and say, okay, here's what the co-op program looks like. Here are the contacts for it. Here's a link to the dealer locator. Here's a link to the ads. Here's how the structure of this program works. We try to simplify that process so that you can print it out, print it out bring it to the dealer and say, hey, here's the program for your stuff, just so you know, and we can help you with it. 
and then you boil it down to the advertising itself, itself the compliance rules related to the advertising, and there's a bunch of more fine print, you know, what they can include in that, how they need to run, more or less, if you can boil all that down for folks and just show them specifically what the ads can look like, it can make a huge difference. You know, really just focus on the ads themselves. The manufacturers put them out there. We database them. This is brand content that just loads up into our database normally. Bring these to your local Wrangler dealer, your local Carhartt dealer, your local Pandora dealer, Benjamin Moore, et cetera, et cetera, and say, hey, here's an ad for your shop. Here's what I would do to get the intention of the audience we bring to the table and make it work that way. I mean, print, you know, all of this stuff has been around for a billion years. All of these ads have a base in co-op. You've seen them before. Start to sell these now and look at inserts. You know, there's another opportunity for you. You know, have you seen a, a, an optician run an ad with you? They all have co-op. Marshawn is a pretty prevalent brand across the United States. You know, it's the frames. And you know, this guy got half of the back page of this insert covered just by doing this. And inserts, you know, you use standard documentation from newspapers to do that. You don't need anything highfalutin. You look at direct mail, it's kind of the same thing. You can use postal documentation for, for all of the claim documentation you need to do. And, you know, you know based on, you can pull together some pretty neat geo-targeted campaigns with direct mail and maybe even add, you know, your own different lists subscriber list to you know, their customer bases to make this a little more palatable. And online, yeah, you can do this online too. You know, manufacturers are pushing these dealers more and more to this, you know, and there's a lot of pretty relevant content out there. You know, that one little banner you saw there was for a Mar Garage Doors. This other one is for Hyundai Automotive. Always make sure that you're giving equal view to both the brand and the local dealer with these structures. And on a different note, you know, instead of linking directly to the dealer's website, maybe focus on a landing page that might give them more place to put it, information about the offer they have. Um, but kind of roll with that. You know, the URL type of documentation is what the manufacturer is going to require to get it done. And so, Tim, a, a lot of our, our people who are taking on new products, like working, like uh, building websites for their customers and, and, and having landing pages on their community community directories, those those initiatives can be funded through co-op advertising too, right? Oh, absolutely. And we have content related to this. Um, you know, specific banners that the manufacturer have pushed down to all dealers to show exactly how to do this stuff. Uh, specific you know, criteria as far as how to um, provide an SEM or SEO campaign that will be funded by the brand itself to help folks know when they Google appliances in New Jersey where to go and find Whirlpool appliances at my place in Bridgewater, New Jersey. And there are all structures around this stuff. With online, they require a little more documentation. They need a screenshot of what the actual display was, a URL report of, you know, okay, how many click-throughs did I get on that? Um, and I hear a lot of beeps from manufacturers on the links directly to a dealer's website without any specific content drive. But, you know, a landing page to, to be kind of a middle ground between there and the website could be a good strategy. It could be as simple as the print ad they're running with you. You just need more space to describe the offer and why consumers should buy from them today. Now, really kind of make that process as simple as possible and read through what the manufacturer requires from all of that stuff. Um, mobile, I think Kenny Hubert is the only one who knows how this stuff works, but you know, this is really still an event. <laughs> you know, there's not a lot of space that you can use to devote to co-branding on mobile. Uh, I display here an uh, uh, auto service place with Valvoline Motor Oil. That could be funded by Valvoline, although I haven't gone through it. You know, there are some programs, mostly automotive-related, that do fund mobile campaigns. 
I have seen things done with some of the camera brands as well, um, but it's always very specially arranged. It's always up through a lot of scrutiny from the manufacturer, and they want to really gauge results as compared to what the spend was. So it's not the easiest stuff to do, but it can be done. Really what you got to do is put these campaigns together into proposals, put them across to the dealers. And instead of, you know, hey, your standard print campaign and everybody thinks co-op is just print, okay, going to run the ads on these dates, here's the ad, doesn't it look cool? Um, add online to it. Okay, now we're going to run this print campaign and in between on our website we're going to run this banner advertising related to it that's going to go to a landing page with this particular ad, which will then shove over to your website show them how this stuff works, and that's going to make a difference. You know, you're still going to have to go through compliance, which is getting the ads approved through the manufacturer. It sounds scary, but once you're working with a dealer and you've got content that the dealer wants to run, the manufacturer will help you. They're there to help the dealer advertise. You don't prospect through these guys, but once you're involved with a dealer, they will help you through the process. They have sometimes have online portals to put this stuff through. Some of them you can email that across to a specific address and somebody will review that. Turnaround time you should allow is about 48 hours. But once the manufacturer has reviewed it, it's been databased on their side, so payment is expedited on the co-op reimbursement. And the manufacturer is pretty much embedded in, hey, you are helping this dealer now. Yeah, the other Play thing effect. about that is if you if you have a if you're using that for electronic things like web pages and, and landing pages and things like that, those go on for a long time. So that's not like just trying to get approval for one ad. Those things are evergreen. It's like a gift that keeps on giving because you're getting paid all, all the way along once you get approval. Precisely. And you know, once you've developed that relationship with the manufacturer is helping this dealer, there may be other dealers in the market that manufacturer needs to help as well. And they may help you with them. They might actually ping you to say, hey, have you talked to this guy? He needs help too. And that's one thing I played off of in my last newspaper that was very lucrative, you know, just developing relationships with these guys, you know, with the, plant, the folks who run these plants. Because their goal is to increase adoption, make sure the dealers use these monies, make sure that they do it correctly. And they're spiffed based on, you know, the adoption of these programs with the local dealer base. The last piece is the claim documentation itself, which I apparently just messed up. Um, the key here is providing the base documentation for this stuff. The invoice, tear sheet, screenshot, et cetera, that makes up the balance of this schedule they've run with you. With Recast, it gives you kind of a claim documentation uh, template that you can work from that boils everything down and counts to the manufacturer as a claim form from the dealer. What the dealer needs to submit is, at the very least, an invoice from you on the schedule they ran, proof of performance, the tear sheets, screenshots, seed shot, you know, all of that stuff that support the line items on the invoice, and a co-op claim, a detail of, hey, I spent X amount of money promoting the brand. Here's the line item stuff related to what I did. You owe me $1,500 based on my $3,000 schedule. With recounts, we boil down, okay, where you send that to, who the dealer was, all of the date and cost information related to it, and then the bottom line reimbursement for the dealer. But all you really need to provide is you know, the basic proof of performance stuff, the tear sheets electronically or in print, and validate with the manufacturer whether they'll take them electronically, most will, um, and the documentation, the, the invoice, any URL documentation for anything online, all of that stuff is noted on the co-op program, uh, either directly from the manufacturer or through us. We tell you what they need and have the dealer submit it so that they get reimbursed. Um, we try to make this simple. 
we try to database what the manufacturer requirements are and the actual materials that these dealers have provided to help them promote that brand. You guys are kind of the next step, showing these guys how to do it. And that's where you know the rubber meets the road. Recast can take it so far, we can tell you what the stuff is. We can even give you some of the approved content from the manufacturer along with the detail. But you've got to bring it to the dealers and provide the solutions there. That's pretty much it. Here's my contact information. Um, I look forward to seeing you in Washington, D.C., that conference Bob was talking about earlier. And just remember, co-op advertising is not something else to sell. It's not another special section. It's not another initiative related to online or whatever the case may be. It's a way you can sell everything. It's a way you can sell more. And don't forget, if you have questions for any of these people, most of them, are, most of them will be there live at the East Coast Free Paper Conference in Washington, D.C., I know many of them share my personal philosophy at conferences, which is, if you have a question and an open bar tab, I'm your guy. That's 2020. I want to thank IFPA for the opportunity to share that time with you, and I look forward to more in the future. In the meantime, this is Bob Munn speaking for Tim Brennan and the entire IFPA Board of Directors saying, the future doesn't begin tomorrow. It's starting right now, this instant, with what you plan to do with the ideas you saw today. There's still plenty of time today to help your customers make some money, and you're just the folks to do it. Have a great day, everyone, and thanks for stopping in.